Hey, Joey, welcome to the Virtual CMO Podcast. So glad you could join us today. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks, man. You know, I'm excited as always about the conversations that we have on this show about marketing. And today, you know, I'd love to focus on just some of the basics. You know, our audience for this show typically are small and mid-sized businesses. Maybe they have a dedicated marketing team or sometimes they outsource it, bring in agencies or freelancers to help them with their marketing. But I know, you know, when we talk about marketing, there are some basics that just everybody needs to kind of focus some of their efforts on. And so if you could, I'd love for us to dive into this a little bit today in our conversation. But if you would just give the audience a little bit of background on yourself and, uh, and how you're helping clients in the marketplace today. Yeah, for sure. So my, as you said, my name is Joey Donovan Guido and uh, born in Brooklyn, New York and uh, living in Madison, Wisconsin now. And I've had a... That's where I was born. You're kidding. Oh, I'm a Madison boy. I'm a Badger. Oh boy. When did you move? <laughs> well, a long time ago, but yeah, I was born there. <laughs> oh, that's super cool. We love it here. It is. Uh, it's an amazing town. Uh, yeah, so I, I started I started my web design firm, Cup of SEO. It'll be, it'll be nine years ago in January. That's a blink of an eye. Yeah. And really, you know, what we do in the marketplace is we keep it real tight. We we help uh, clients get found on Google, really. Mm. And the way we do that is by building them custom websites that that get found, build trust, and make it easy for website visitors to turn into customers. And there are fancy technical terms for that that we can get into. Um, but that's really, you know, what we look to do is look at websites holistically. Uh, as a whole and not look at little compartmentalized parts of marketing or websites. That's so interesting because, you know, I think for many people, they look at websites and obviously your website is your digital home on the web. But oftentimes I think businesses lose sight of what the purpose of the website is, right? right. The purpose is to educate, inform, and then convert people into contacts that uh, might be interested in doing business with you. And so there's some real steps and intentionality that you have to have as you design your website. So yeah. I'm interested as you engage with clients early on in the process, what is some of that initial discussion that you talk to them about, about how they need to look at their website? Yeah, that's a great question. And really the way we do it is we try to take the pressure off the client. Um, so I'll have a, a, a couple of initial conversations with them and just get to know them and understand them. And kind of just let them talk about their business. What are their pain points? What are their goals? Um, what have they been doing in, in the realm of marketing? Uh, and that helps give me a really good idea of who they are, uh, what they do, and what we need to do with them. Um, but the, really, the, the biggest things come down to, you know, what is, what is the benefit that your services or products offer? Yeah. Uh, because all too often, you're, you're absolutely right businesses lose sight of what the website is for. And they think it's to kind of to sell. Yes. Yes. And to say, Hey, look, we got this award last month. Uh, and we've got, you know, 300 years of experience on our team of 30 people. And, you know, the person showing up on that website doesn't care about yes. any of that. They want to know, can you solve my pain? Yes. You know, and I always like to say people don't go to the dentist because of where that dentist went to school. Right. They go to the dentist because they literally have pain. Yes. Well, it's funny, you know, Simon Sinek has this great book, you know, Start With Why, right? Which mm -hmm. I think is great. But I think many businesses, when it comes to presentations, collateral, their website, you know, theirs is Start With I, right? It's all about what they do, what the, their product or service does, their features, the, the greatness of, of whatever it is that they're selling, rather than what it's actually doing for you as a customer. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So as you start to look at a website, I mean, obviously conversion focused is very important. You want to generate leads from a website, not only educate people, but help them find a way to educate themselves because so much of that now is taking place on, on a customer's own time. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So share a little bit about that. How do you frame a website in terms of being able to educate people about a customer's product or service? Yeah, so so it's it's kind of, it's kind of a three step process. So, but like before we get to that, um, the, the first thing we, thing we do is we work on optimizing the website. So mm -hmm. we, what that means is something called search engine optimization or SEO, 
And that really is essentially making it easier for that website to get found on Google. Yes. Right. So when someone does a search query for like, you know, uh, web design in Madison, Wisconsin or SEO in Madison, Wisconsin, we want them to find us. So we use keyword phrases and content that do that. So that's kind of like the preliminary, almost like opening the door, getting the person, the visitor to your website. Yes. Now, the whole thing is if we got 10,000 new visitors a month to a website and the website, think about like if you go to a hotel and you walk in and it smells musty and it looks dusty and it's just like, ugh. Yeah. I need a different room or I need to find a different motel or hotel. You know, that's what's called a user experience. So once we get somebody there, the first thing we need to do is help them feel comfortable, yes. start to build trust, make them kind of feel like, hey, I, I know the lay of the land here. I, I, I see where I've landed. It's where I expected to land for this particular search query I did. Um, and this user experience methodology is directly tied to conversion. Mm -hmm. Because as you could imagine, if you show up on a website and you, you feel like, ah, oh, aesthetically, it looks nice. Things are clear. We've gotten rid of all the distraction and the noise of moving parts and, and you know, uh, pop-ups and all these things that we can talk more about but can often be detrimental to conversion. Yes. Um, and then we have a really nice, clear, single, maybe two calls to action. So it's a nice flow, right? And then when we have that call to action, we want to make sure that we're making it hit that pain point, address it directly. Don't beat around the bush, right? With the dentist, hey, if you've got pain, we can help. Click here to make your appointment. Something simple like that can go a long way in rising your conversion. I like the way you frame that in making people feel comfortable. You want to speak to the customer in their own language, describe that you understand what they might be going through, talk a little bit about how your product or service might help them address one of those pains or several of those pains. But then you also talk about this idea of a call to action. At some point, you want them to do something. And it's amazing how many websites lead you nowhere. There's no call to action. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's often no call to action. Sometimes you're even missing a contact button or or a tab in your top level navigation which is like well how how is somebody going to know to get in touch with you if that contact page isn't easily available um oftentimes too we'll see too many conversion methodologies so yeah. somebody's got eight products and they throw all they so they throw eight conversion buttons on the home page um or they like you know like to go back to the dentist they'll be like hey download a free um uh, one sheet or a PDF about how to keep your teeth free of plaque. And, you know, I mean, it's great for a blog post. Mm -hmm. But when someone shows up on that dentist homepage, man, you want them to book an appointment, not download something. Yes. Um, yeah. So it goes back to like understanding what your customer needs are. I sometimes call this like the Netflix syndrome. You know, if you've ever sat down in front of Netflix and scrolled up page after page after page of movies and TV shows, eventually, you know, you just get exhausted and you end up watching something you've seen before because mm. it's just an easier choice. And I see that with a lot of web page design that's out there. They're giving people too many choices, too many different calls to action, navigational tips, whatever. And it just becomes exhausting and you leave because you don't know where to go. What's the next appropriate thing to do? Yeah. I, I love that. That is a great analogy. Um, and to kind of piggyback on that, what, what Netflix also does, I think often poorly is they give you kind of like the call to action, right? They give you these, these suggest based on your watching history, here are some suggestions for you. And sometimes I look at them and I'm like, where did these come from? Yes. It has nothing to do with what I've watched or what I want to watch. Right. It's totally out of alignment. Yes. When you talked about calls to action and, you know, downloadable assets like a PDF and I, we're in a different time, right? Things are changing. It used to be that people would have white papers on their websites and those would be popular downloads or infographics. But we're moving into an area where video is so popular and other things. What are you finding working with your clients that are still successful, downloadable assets versus needing to make things like video on demand without that kind of gate in front of it? Mm -hmm. that, that's a really great question. Vi video is tricky. Yeah. Um, we've got we've got some clients that we've worked with over the years. Widen is one of them. They're a, they do um, software as a service. They're international. 
And they have done a great job with video because what they do is they do a lot of repurposing. So they'll mm -hmm. do they'll do a webinar and of course, you know, record that webinar and then repurpose it on their website. So it becomes usable content either on a blog post or on their videos page. And then what, what we would do is also take that and transcribe it into like two or three blog posts. Yep. So repurposing it again. Um, so you really get a lot of bang for your buck when you do video like that. Um, uh, you know, kind of that whole gated thing. I am not an expert in that area because I don't, I don't do gated video for myself because I've always found it to be very challenging to get people who sure. want to get behind that gate. Um, what I'm finding that can be really successful for video that is also somewhat manageable, even for smaller businesses, is to do things like video testimonials, mm -hmm. right? Or to do something if, as long as they can muster up the comfort and the, um, you know, <laughs> the desire to do small videos, kind of like what we're doing today, but maybe like for five minutes and just sit down in front of the camera and talk uh, just about one of the main pain points that their clients uh, struggle with. Um, I would say the biggest advice I could give for video is the same advice I would give for any web page or blog post, and it's to make it about them, not you. Mm. The, the, the less it's salesy, the more it's about developing a relationship and just giving really good information, like you know the top six areas to optimize on your website. Yes. Pe people aren't going to learn it all in five minutes, but at least you're giving them some knowledge. Yeah. Oh, I think that's great because, you know, one of the reasons that we're doing this as a live stream today is because it creates a video asset. Yes, we're going to put together a blog post on this podcast. We are going to put together some video snippets that we'll use on social media. And yes, ultimately, the audio podcast will come out and be out across all those players. But what we're trying to do is make the content consumable the way the listener, the viewer ultimately wants to consume it, right? And we get a lot of videos uh, on the on the video channels, Facebook and YouTube, et cetera. So it's important to make that an option for people because we definitely are in an age of video. Yeah, that's a great point. And that that whole thing about it being consumable, how somebody wants it, that's again making it about them. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I I find that when I do a video, I'm always extremely self conscious about it as as sure. the guy on the video. But I find when I post that on social, it gets hundreds more views than. Just a just a you know a photo with a with a with content, with with words, um, but I think it's important to understand like everybody's different. Like you said earlier, sometimes you have a marketing team, sometimes you don't. So whether it's video or blogging, uh, it's it's really about what what's manageable for you as the person creating the content. Well, you know, one thing I would love to get your thoughts on because I know you do some webinars. And I think sometimes people look at webinars and they think back to the corporate days when you've got to, you know, get one of these fancy webinar platforms to, to put everything together. It doesn't really need to be all that complicated, does it? You know, just getting out there, putting yourself on video, you can create a reusable webinar asset, you know, in the exact same situation, the exact same setup that you and I are recording this today. Yeah. Yeah, it's super easy now. You're whole, totally right. It's used to be you had to have, spend all these dollars every month to have WebEx or whatever it was and, you know, StreamYard, even Zoom, even if you don't want to live stream, if you feel like that's too much, you can always use Zoom and record it. Or I think you can do the same with StreamYard, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, and then, you know, record it and then upload it and then, you know, upload it to YouTube and then share it on social. Yeah. And there are some great little additional tools. Somebody, uh, clued me into a tool. It's it, the, I think the product name is terrible, but it's called, mm -hmm, you know, M M H M M. And it's basically a little plugin that allows you to put like the video over your shoulder, you know, like they have on the evening newscast or something like that, or an easy way to insert slides into a video recording. And it's actually super helpful and it's a plugin. So it can work with any video platform that you're using. I could have it enabled here, for example. And it's just a way to add something more than just your face uh, to whatever you're doing. You can show a slide or a picture or a graphic or a video uh, as well as your face. And so there are, there are a ton of simple solutions that can really up your production level at a very low cost or no cost at all. Yeah, that's a great point. And and to, to your earlier point about like this this preconception of webinars, um, I used to think of them as kind of like stiff, almost stoic, you know, really like um, 
these these professional things that happened that nobody was really excited about. And I, I think that's been changing for years, especially with the pandemic. Uh, you know, when, when, when I do a webinar or, or, a, or an online workshop, man, for me, it's all about just like having that relationship, even though it's virtual, even though you're not here with me, you know, it's we're talking and the more we can engage with each other, um, the more value that has. And that and that's what I'll do. It's good advice, I think, when, when if you're going to do a webinar or a talk or a workshop, you know, I never wait till the end to take questions. Mm, yeah. Because, man, you know, Eric, if you're sitting there thinking, what does he mean by that? I want to give you an opportunity within a couple of minutes of me saying something to say, hey, Joey, I don't understand. Yeah. Or yeah. I don't agree. Uh, and, and this is a spe specific style. Not everybody is comfortable with that, but I find it is much more engaging. The audience is much more uh, apt to be paying attention. Yeah, I think the more that you can add that interactive element so that people feel they're part of it. I mean, especially now, you know, as we're sort of working our way through this pandemic, people are so tired of Zoom calls because, you know, it's this crazy thing because it just locks your attention into the screen. It can be very fatiguing after a while, but having that element of interactivity where people can participate in some ways, I think is so important. I think, you know, we've seen the rise of things like virtual summits and other ways to sort of interact virtually, but interacting in some way is a key part of that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, there is that fatigue and it's, I, I just feel like, the more we can have a conversation, the, the, just the better it works out. Yeah, I agree. What have you seen in terms of, I know you specialize in SEO, but what have you seen in terms of some of the changes that Google has been rolling out in terms of page speed and optimization? Have you really seen client websites taking a hit or is it largely a non-event? I mean, what's been your you know, early feedback from it? Yeah, it's it's kind of all over the place. We, okay. we, we're very lucky that we, we I've been doing this for years, a long time. Uh, and so typically when Google makes a change, they kind of make a change that aligns themselves with how we do the search engine optimization anyway. Mm. Um, so we're, we're big believers in not breaking any rules, even if something looks like it might be breaking a rule. Like we we optimize every single image on a, every client's website. We optimize yep. the image and the alt image name. A lot of SEO firms don't do that, and I'm kind of puzzled as to why they don't. Um, but we've got an internal rule where these image names need to be typically 50 characters or less. Now, that's not a Google rule. That's a Joey rule. That's a cup of SEO rule because as soon as you start to get past 50 characters, it starts to look spammy. Okay. Right? And if it looks spammy to the human eye, it's a very good chance it might look spammy to Google. Mm. So really, it's like common sense. You know, if you're trying to work the system, you're probably going to get busted now or down the road. Yeah. If, if you're really, truly thinking about that customer experience and making it them first, um, you typically fall into alignment with Google. There are certain rules you don't want to break. What I've seen uh, clients get hit really hard, there's, um, there's one that is, I'm going to forget the acronym now, it's it's not FOMO. It's not fear of missing out. It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> it was financial websites that were strictly financial, and there were also medical websites. Mm. That, you know, thing that's that's like what they did was talk about talk about procedures, talk about uh, medical news, um, things like hospitals, clinics, yep, um, doctors' offices, and there was this is goes back over a year, I think, where there was there was a change in um in algorithm and some of these websites were getting slammed oh really yeah and then the problem was for a few months some of these websites that had nothing to do with finance or medical were getting hit hard because the algorithm oftentimes goes too far and then needs to correct yep yep so once in a while a client will call and say joey what happened we were ranking first for for page on page one for all these different keywords and now we're like we're not yes um, so I typically know if, if, a update has happened, um, but we'll kind of walk, walk through it. And usually that, uh, that corrects itself without us, my team needing to take any action within a couple of weeks. Um, but we have to look at it because sometimes the client does something and they don't realize what they did. Just broke hurt, hurt them. Yeah. Well, you might not be able to answer this specifically, but that 
that brings up a curious question to me. So let's say that you did rank number one for a number of keywords. Google pushes out an update and maybe there was something now that's broken on your page that they're dinging you for. And so you drop down in the rankings, assuming you get that fixed. So now you're sort of 100% in a compliance, if that's ever possible. How fast could you expect to recover your ranking? It's That's a great question. So, and I, and I can answer that. So what happens is when you take a dip in ranking for whatever reason, sometimes it's because you're not pumping out fresh content, yep. typically a blog, right? Even if you're doing a video, you need to blog. They put fresh actual words on the page so Google can see it. Um, so you might stop blogging for a few weeks or months, or let's say all of a sudden you're out of compliance. Like one of the not so recent changes was you had to be SSL certified, or in other words, you had to have that little lock on your website. So it was quote unquote secure. Um, for most websites that weren't selling websites, that made no difference. But Google didn't care. If you were non-compliant with the SSL, you could get dinged. And I always mm -hmm. say you could get dinged because they're kind of not overtly objective about who they <laughs> ding and who they don't. Sure. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing though, if you, all of a sudden, you know, the deadline came and you were no longer compliant with that, with that SSL, um, you might take a hit. Okay. Right. So, and I, I've seen that happen pretty quick where like, you're not that you could take a dip within a week or two. Right. Um, and then when you fix it, you can pop back up within a week or two. Okay. Um, you know, if, if, if something happens where like all the SEO on a page goes away, like somebody on the team changed everything and didn't say, Hey, cup SEO, are we good? Do you need to optimize this? That, that you won't see changes like that happen. It could take a couple of weeks, but more likely it's going to take a few weeks to up to 90 days for you to start to see a dip. Um, and then, you know, the flip side of that is once you start to make the corrections, it might take up to 90 days for you to get back to where you were. Makes sense. Yeah. But you're not looking at six to nine months before Google starts to slowly recognize. It's not like you're, you're back to square one. You, you can recover from them relatively quickly. You, yes, you can. Re you can pretty much recover from anything unless you're really doing some black hat things. Uh, once I worked for a company who shall not be named. <laughs> <laughs> it was an international company who, uh, who had a local business here in Wisconsin, kind of a subsidiary subsidiary. And they were breaking all kinds of rules. Mm. They were literally in what I call the black hole of Google mm. Panda, you know, like black hole in space. Like you just disappear. You're gone. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you, you couldn't find them in a keyword search. If you knew the URL, you'd find them. And that was it. Um, what they were doing is they, they were publishing a blog post a day and it was total garbage. It was obvious that it was being posted for SEO reasons, not for value. Gotcha. Um, that took me about six months to fix. Okay. And it, 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 it's not rocket science. There's ways to fix it. And we took them from less than 10 hits a day to over a hundred, Yeah, which, you know, for a small local business, it's a big deal. It's pretty good. It was, yeah. you know, 10 times the amount of traffic. And it did help tremendously with, with their conversion, with their business growth. Interesting. Yeah, it's a complex world. You know, as a podcast host, people regularly reach out to me to be guests on the show. And I would say that at least half of the inquiries that I get are from SEO experts. It's it's such an important element of business. It's constantly evolving and changing and something that businesses need to keep an eye on. It's not like you can create a website, create some content one time, and then just sit back for 10 years and let it go, right? It right. needs to constantly be be nurtured. So for people who might be looking for an ex SEO expert to come into their business and really help them with their website, how could they find you guys and uh, and get in touch with you? Oh, yeah. So so they can find us just by going to cupofseo.com. Uh, we kind of named the business off of a cup of Joe, since my yeah, name I like is Joey. That. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's cupofseo.com. And there's all kinds of great information there, too. So if you're just looking for more information about SEO or kind of like what to look for when you're hiring a web design firm, um, or if you're working with one and you're wondering, hey, are they doing a good job? Are they actually optimizing my website or am I kind of burning my money with them? Uh, there's a lot of good information there. But otherwise, just go, you know, everything you need to know is on there for web design or SEO, and you can just go ahead and uh, hit the contact button and get in touch. I'd love to talk to you.
Hey, that's great. I know you've got some uh, great uh, webinar replays on the on the website as well that have some great tips for people. So I'd encourage people to go check that out. And we'll also make sure that all of that is linked up in the show notes so that people can uh, find you. Joey, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. I've really enjoyed our conversation. This is a fascinating topic. Yeah, man, you're welcome. Thanks for having me today. Thank you.